Today we reflect on the readings for the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our first reading comes from the beginning of the second chapter of Ezekiel. We're praying with Psalm 123. Our second reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and our gospel comes to us from Mark chapter 6. Our readings are, in one sense, fairly simple, but they speak to a broad sense of what we go through and, and a broad sense of our struggle to follow God the way that we're supposed to today. Our first reading is since this is Ezekiel chapter 2. In the beginning of chapter 2, this is the very beginning of his work, and so it's sort of setting the trajectory for where we're going. And it's always good to have in the back of our mind where we are in a book or in a story. So especially anything that falls into sort of a narrative-ish type thing, um, especially when we get to the Gospels, we want to have that in the back of our mind. It sort of paints a, paints a picture, even if we don't know necessarily what the rest of the story is going to be or don't know all of the pieces of the puzzle, especially in the Old Testament. It can help us a little bit understand what's going on. Um, and so we have the Lord coming to um, Ezekiel. The Spirit enters him, sets him on his feet, puts him in the direction of mission. And what I just want to encourage you maybe to pray with the end, especially with what we do know of the Old Testament, even just from going to Mass, um, is the different struggles we have. The time where we go into exile the time where we choose things that are contrary to God, the moments where we don't do what we're supposed to do. We have, of course, Christ coming and correcting that, where we have our brothers and sisters failing to do what they're supposed to do. And, of course, we continue in that trajectory because of concupiscence, man's tendency to sin as a result of the fall. So we have that in the back of our mind. We're told that um, the ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. And so they've been doing it for a long time, up until the very present, and God is going to send Ezekiel to them in order to sort of shake them out of the way in which they're living. And he says, But you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. I say this often because if we don't get this right, we're missing a significant part of our life as Christians. That from the moment of our baptism, we are called to be priests, prophets, and kings, in the world. We have a share in each one of those areas of our life. It's easy for us to have the attitude of that is the job of the priest, that is the job of the deacon, that is the job of the church staff, that's the job of the religious in the world. We are all called to do this. And the beautiful thing is, so we have two deacons here, have very different personalities, have different preaching styles. We're all going to do this different. You all know multiple priests. I do things different than my brother priest. There's obviously a lot of things that keep us similar in how we approach life. We say the same mass. We have the same sacraments. But our manner in which we do it, the manner in which we preach is different. The way in which you take the good news out is going to be different. And just like we have in the reading today, the people up until today, and unless Jesus comes back, it will be tomorrow and the day after, are going to continue to turn against God. It is our job to tell them about the gospel, whether they accept it or whether or not they reject it. But what they need to know is that they have come face to face with the gospel. Now we do that in many different ways. First and foremost is through the example of our life. Um, the way in which we approach the gospel, the way in which we take care of our brothers and sisters can go a very long way in people understanding what it means to love the gospel. I love those stories where people um, come and say they're going to join the church or they want to enter into it. And I said, you know, what led you here? It's people that I knew who were Catholic. They were happy. They were joyful. Or when difficult things came to them, they were a little bit different in their mannerisms or they took care of the needy, just all the different ways it manifests itself. That's the most powerful way in which we have to teach. We also need to do it with our mouth. And of course, this needs to be with prudence, with love, with charity, but it does need to happen. And all those different circumstances are going to be different. Sometimes we need to push harder. Sometimes we need to push more gentle. Sometimes it's a very soft invitation. Sometimes it's very much in your face. We look to Jesus as the, the prime example of what this looks like. Sometimes he is very direct, very harsh, and sometimes he's unbelievably soft and gentle. Different times, different people call for different responses. Pray for wisdom, pray for prudence, and whenever you do it, Prayerfully, prayerfully reflect on what you could have done different, asking God to show you how you maybe didn't do the best or where you opened yourself up to let God work through you. 
speaking of prophets, Paul. This is one of my favorite passages of Paul, and I love it because Paul gives us a beautiful insight into his heart many different times. Sometimes he can be seen as arrogant or proud, but I think it's proper humility where he says, if you live like me, you're going to make it home to heaven. And that can be off-putting to some people, but I think especially if we read the entirety of what Paul says, including today's passage, we understand again it's that proper humility. And today he shows us some of the struggle. And so he's speaking to the church in Corinth, and this is a church he did not get along with. If you read between the lines and put these letters um, and back to back and understand how he's responding to things that they would have said, these are not nice people to him. And so this is not a church that Paul gets along with. But Paul says that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations. And so Paul acknowledges that he has had these beautiful encounters with God, these beautiful revelations, beautiful moments of grace. He knows he's doing God's work in the world. He says that I don't become too elated, meaning pumped up, too focused on himself. He says a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Now, personally, I wish Paul would have been a little bit more explicit on what this thorn is. We don't know what it is. Theologians love to propose different ideas. It may have been a sin. Some propose even a sin against the sixth and ninth commandment. Um, some think that maybe it's just the people that he's dealing with. Again, he's dealing with the church in Corinth who did not get along with the way um, that we would like all of us Christians to get along with. And so maybe it's just some of his parishioners as a bishop, as a priest, that he's having to deal with that are making his life difficult. It may have been, you know, something wrong with his body. Maybe he had a backache or a hip ache. Could have been something that slowed down the work that he did. Um, I never really watched the show, but some of my siblings did. They were a um, little behind me, but there's a nice little meme out there of SpongeBob following along and being annoying to St. Paul. You know, it could have been any sort of thing. We're not sure exactly what it is, but what we do know is that God allowed Paul to have some cross that kept him humble that kept him realizing that God was the one in control. And so three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Now, many of you who've gone to confession and you come frustrated and express that frustration and having to confess the same sins over and over again, first of all, you're in the same boat that I am, I oftentimes will reference this passage. Three times I begged the Lord. Whenever we see three, we can believe that Paul maybe had three very specific times that he asked the Lord in prayer to take this away, but also in a spiritual sense, that means infinite, repeated. And so we can take this to our own prayer, especially if this is a sin, repeated struggle, go to the Lord, and God just says, my grace is sufficient. Why God allows us to sin when we don't want to do it, Paul will say elsewhere, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I do want to do. Same with me. He allows us to fall so that we can learn to lean on him more or to realize that it is not us doing the good work, that it is God working through you. Now, Paul finishes up with, he says, Therefore, I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And he knows he is not the one doing the work. It is Jesus working through him? I could spend another half an hour just sort of teasing this out, playing with it a little bit, but I want to encourage you um, to go back to pray with that passage, especially in anything that you struggle with, whether it is sin or whether it is just some cross that has been given to you that you really, really don't like. God has given it to you for some reason. His grace is sufficient. You can ask him in prayer, God, it would be nice if you revealed to me part of what is going on, and he may, he may not. It's up to him, but in the end, he's going to take care of you, and whatever he's allowing you to go to go through is for your salvation, to make it the easiest way for you to get home. To our gospel. Jesus departs from there, and we're, we're getting ourselves ready soon, as I keep pointing to, because we want to have our eye moving forward where we're going in the story, is John chapter 6, Multiplication of the Loaves, Bread of Life Discourse, Our Lord Teaching on the Eucharist. And it's inserted where it would go in Mark's gospel. So we also want to know that this is where Mark's story is going to. He just briefly touches on it where John draws it out a little bit more for us, which is why we make that jump. Because again, Mark is very pithy in everything that he does. But Jesus, on the Sabbath, goes to the synagogue and goes to teach. And the people are confounded. And again, this is a good thing for us to take to our own prayer. 
to just sort of reflect on where do we struggle to receive what God is giving us and what is the cause for that struggle? So they know Jesus' teaching here, but also outside because they speak of um, his teaching, but also his mighty deeds done by his hands. They're also speaking of the miracles of his done. And their response is, is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Because they know where Jesus comes from. And just briefly, the language that they use for siblings here could easily mean cousins. And so this is not the biological siblings of Jesus. The church has taught that since the very beginning. It's cousins, extended family. They didn't have the same words that we have today um, because they viewed family very differently, which is why Jesus is able to just be called the son of David and not like the 18th great grandson of David. So just looked at family differently. We don't want to hold our standards against them because they came before us in this area. But because they know where he comes from, they want to limit his authority. And so Jesus points out, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. Sometimes, and parents, you know this very, very well, it is hard to preach to our family because they've seen our sin. They've seen our struggle. They know some of the things that we go through. They know that we do not always practice what we preach. It's a reason why for most cases, priests do not go back to their home parish. Now, Divine Mercy is an exception because we had Father Joe return home. Um, that is not how it normally goes because of this passage of the reality that it is. If people are not willing to accept Jesus, it's often that they're not going to want to accept us for the same reasons. Because that he was not able to perform many mighty or any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. One of my hopes in this life is that Jesus is never amazed at my lack of faith. We have to be cautious. We have to be careful. And so what might this look like in our life? It might be the person who is proclaiming the truth. It might be myself because of whatever reason you don't care for my style, my preaching, something that I've said in the past, something I've done in the past. Maybe I was short with you at some time in confession. I've, I am a sinner. There are many ways in which I, maybe I hurt you. Maybe you don't want to hear the message from me. Maybe you don't want to hear it from your spouse because it came from your spouse and right now you're fighting with him or her or your children or your boss who you don't like at all. You can't wait until um, you're able to move into a new position. I have to report to him or her or whatever can change at work, right? The list can go on and on. Maybe God has been saying something through them, but because we don't like who is the messenger, we push it away. That doesn't discredit the message. The truth is a truth no matter who says it, no matter how big of a sinner they may or may not be. And so maybe spend some time reflecting, asking God to show you, come Holy Spirit, show me where I failed to receive your truth, your teaching. Uh, just one last image maybe to, to keep in our mind. We have the question of Zechariah and Mary at the Annunciation. Zechariah doubts, God, you cannot do this. Mary asks for understanding how is it possible. Zechariah has to go silent so he can humble himself before the God, before the Lord to work through this. Mary is blessed. Because she doesn't doubt, she just is seeking understanding, which is absolutely okay. Maybe again, something to keep in our mind in areas where maybe we're pushing away the messages we don't like where it comes from. God bless. Mm -hmm.